um, actually, uh, uh, she, uh, uh, just like uh, myself or uh, Professor Yu, all get a uh, mass uh, PhD uh, some time ago, uh, and also uh, taught in university, uh, but uh, later uh, she uh, become a data scientist uh, in industry. Uh, so uh, this will be our probably first uh, talk, you know, outside of academics. Uh, so hopefully we may have a more talk in that direction in the future. So it's my pleasure to be here today. My name is Ji Li. I'm a data scientist. And I'm going to be very glad to talk to, uh, talk to you about data science in action. Outline. First of all, we're going to go through a quick overview of what data science is. And then i show you a quick demo uh, of the mature model. And the second example will be a email analysis result um, based on some kind of data science project I did. And in the end, I talk about some, I uh, introduce to you some data science tools that I like to use. And uh, if we have time, we can uh, quickly talk about big data. It's out there. Okay? So, uh, throughout this talk, um, please feel free to stop me anytime you have any questions. And, or, you know, or I was going to pass. So let me know. First, what is data science? If you search on Google, you see all sorts of results. Uh, this is actually, one thing is clear, nobody, there's no industrial standard way of describing what data science is. Honestly, I can only talk to you about data science from my point of view, and that's gonna be what I will focus on. I think data science consists of two parts, skills and domain expertise. So skills are the means required for you to do data science, but domain expertise, in a way, is the driving force for you to actually carry through any data science projects. To be more specific, domain expertise, take a deeper look at domain expertise, which is the data science workflow. So data science workflow is driven by your domain expertise and typically consists of, but is not limited to data mountain, data mining, and delivery of actionable insights. Let's see what data mounting is to begin with. Typically, you want to mount data, prepare data to a format that is ready for you to do data mining. Basically, that's what it is. Often, it includes ETL, extract, transform, and load data. And it means you acquire data from both internal and external sources. For example, you saw some data on the website and you want to load that data and transform it to a format you can use. You can use it alone, but you can also use it with other data you acquire in different ways. After ETL, you want to integrate the data. Integrate data means you pull them together, often means you merge or join data sets based on some key columns, or other things you want to do with it. Through this process, you notice that you want to watch out for data discrepancy, which means any missing data, duplicates, or just incorrect data or incorrect format. Sometimes, if you're working with somebody who's providing you with data, you need to con have contact with them to ask any questions to clarify and verify. One thing you have to bear in mind is that data mining is a process, or data science is a process. It's garbage in, garbage out. If you don't have right data, all you do, all you can do is gonna not be useful, not be meaningful. So having the right data is very important Naturally, data cleansing is an important step, and it doesn't have to finish in the process of data mountain. When you do data mining, when you do machine learning, when you, whenever you identify some bad data or some weird behavior, you want to go back, try to do some more data cleansing. After data mountain is done, you're ready to do some data mining. And here's typical things you want to start with. You want to start with data exploration. Usually means you look at the data, you look at the summary of statistics, or you visually explore the data using the tools that you're more familiar with. I introduce the tools later. So you want to put the data together, check the correlation, and see whether there's something weird going on, and whether some columns are having too high correlation or too low correlation, and whether they make sense to you. So it's a process of examining and making sense of data. And oftentimes when people talk about data science, they think machine learning. Yeah, machine learning is part of data mining. It's not all, but it is an important part of data mining because 
when you visually examine data, you're using your human eyes. Sometimes the pattern may be hidden. It's hard for human eyes to identify immediately. Where you use machine, use a try to some algorithm to identify the pattern for you. And so machine learning usually uh, means you want to construct features and reduce features that are ne unnecessary. And do some uh, choose the right algorithm sometimes means tuning the parameter in a way that fits your data. After machine learning, it's very important to evaluate the model you obtained. And through model evaluation, there are a couple of things you want to do. For example, you can select the best model that fits your data. You can also select the best parameter that fits your data. And you're also able to check other things like top features, which I will describe in, the, in more detail in the example. So after we've seen data mounting, data mining, let's talk a little bit about the skills, skill sets, which may, whenever you ask a question, uh, about what is data science or how to become a data science, here's typically what you will hear about, the skill sets of data scientists. Okay. For doing data science, you need to program a lot. You need to <laughs> pick your favorite tool, and this comes in debate whether Python or R is a better tool. It just really depends on the scenario. And typically, the people, the kind of person, data scientists I work with, I see them have most likely having their most favorite tool or not, uh, one, two, or more, but then they will, they will have a wide range of knowledge about pretty much everything out there, okay? So, you also need to have statistical knowledge. If you think about programming skills as like the soft, uh, the hard skills, then statistical knowledge is a soft skill in the way that you want to know some probability theory and some descriptive statistics and some machine learning. All these fields, especially the machine learning field, is growing vastly fast, like every day, you, every month, you see more papers, new methods, heuristic or theoretical. You see those, so you want to catch up with the, those new papers and new methods by reading those papers. That means you want to take a mindset of constantly learning what's going on out there. Besides programming and statistics, I want to mention that I think data visualization skills is very important for reasons I mentioned in a short moment. Okay. Let's put together domain expertise and skills side by side. You almost see a one-to-one -one correspondence between them. Here you want to use programming skills to mount the data, most likely, and you want to use statistical knowledge to mine the data. Of course you will use some programming to mine the data as well. And then, after all the hard work is done, what really matters for your piece of data science work is the deliverables, so-called actionable insights that came out of this data science project. The actionable insight means something, the insight you extracted from data that is directly actionable to the business users. Not only directly, un immediately understandable to them, but actionable in the sense that they can take actions upon. It's very similar to a doctor prescribing medicine to a patient after a clinical visit, the patient typically expects to receive a prescription from the doctor where he can take the action upon which is taking the medicine. That's why the process of obtaining actionable insights is often called prescriptive analysis. It's almost like prescribing the actions out. And oftentimes, after all the hard work you've done for data mounting and data mining, you want to make sure that the actionable insights, the deliverable you produce, makes sense. Because if it didn't, pretty much all the hard work never count. And one more thing to mention is that most likely actionable insights will be best delivered through meaningful and effective data visualization. Meaning that you want to know how to represent your data visually in the simplest but very effective and powerful way requires you to have some knowledge of visualization. Not to mention that visualization, as I personally have found to be the most fun part in the data science. So jargons aside, let's see some actions. I use the first example, um, the first example is a customer chair model. We will go through it like in this way. We look at the business understanding 
and uh, see what is churn. And then we do a quick demo in R and then take the output from R and do some quick prescriptive analysis. And this example is using fake data, but I hope it at least makes some business on a meaning to you. It's somewhat meaningful. And also, it's a very prototyped example, meaning that in the real life, the data science work typically would be 100 times more complicated than this. But I assume everything happens in a, in a very in a hacky world. So I want to demonstrate to you the, how the workflow looks like. So let's start with business understanding. Um, the goal of customer churn model is to predict which customers will churn. Uh, a, churn a customer is called having churned if he or she has not renewed the subscription after the subscription has expired. In other words, in the world of customer retention, there are two types of customers, churn customers and renewed customers. And ideally, we want to be able to find ways to prevent customers who may be about to be churning from churning. If we can predict those customers, the, uh, which customers will churn, then we can identify means to stop that from happening. Okay. And I go through some data understanding, looking at the piece of data that we're looking, and then load that data into R and do some data mining, and then take the output from R to wrap up. First data understanding, the first piece of data we work on is called customer renewal data. And this is, uh, th there's three columns. Customer ID is churned, yes or no, true, false, and days renewed. Notice that the days renewed equals the number of days the customer has renewed after the subscription expired. So when the customer has churned, naturally days renewed would be null. And in reality, this is considered somewhat a missing data, but it's perfectly valid missing data. Null value makes sense here because you shouldn't have any value for that. Okay, so, and from this data, you can already do some quick exploration, such as look at the customer so-called renewal schedule. And for example, from this customer renewal schedule, you count the number of days after days renewal on the axis. And the y-axis is the distribution of all customers. So you see that up to one day after renewal, actually after two days after renewal, about 60% of all customers have already renewed. In other words, after two days after, oh, sorry, two days after expiration, about 40% of the customers have not renewed. And uh, overall speaking, do you see the, the overall over renewal rate is about 80% or 82%, meaning about 18% of all customers have churned. You want to do some, take some action on those 18% of all customers. Our next set of data, we use a customer service phone call, basically record the number of customer service calls. And you notice these data sets will come from different data sources. This will typically come from customer service logs. And then aggregate on the, each customer's level of um, data. And you notice that, again, we can look at the customer phone call cumulative distribution. And the horizontal axis means the number of phone calls. And the vertical axis means the cumulative distribution. And then we see most customers made maybe at most two phone calls. And some customer made as many as nine phone calls. And on average, customers, each customer made about 1.6 phone calls. You can also have the plan type and demographic data. So for each customer ID, we have is or not international plan, is or not voicemail plan. And because this is phone call information, so we can extract the state, the location information from the area code of each customer's phone, call, uh, phone number. Uh, you can, of course, get the state information possibly from credit card information if you had payment information from the customer. But if the customer has never paid, then you don't have that information. From location, uh, location data, you can, you can get even more data, such as the like, uh, average or median income in that location, in the state or in that city. And those kind of extended data could be sometimes very easy to get, but awfully useful in your data science project. I'm not including them here. And notice one more thing, if you extracted the state information from area code, then this information may not be very accurate. I want to bear that in mind, because most people, when they move from state to state, they have the same phone number. 
This was not the case 10 years ago, most likely, but much more often right now. But still, it serves as a good enough data source, better than nothing. So we also have customer usage data. This will come from, most likely, a gigantic sheet of customer activity log recorded every day, every hour, and aggregated on each customer level. And it records pretty much everything the day minutes, the evening minutes, the night minutes, day charge, evening charge, night charge, day calls, evening calls, and night calls. And these kind of, such kind of activity data or usage data generally is very helpful. It provides a rich data source. And you can aggregate even further in much more detail. For example, you can look at the total number of phone calls each customer made during the last 15 days before subscription expired see whether they were active before subscription expired, and then last 30 days, and so on and so forth. It depends on trial and error for you to cook up those data to begin with, and then identify the good ones. Okay. So these data, in the ideal world, they're all uh, having a column, a unique column called customer ID, so we can patch them together, merge them uh, into a churn data. And if you look at the churn data, we have all the columns we just looked at, and all centered around the customer ID. Next, we're going to look at that data in the R sheet. Okay. So let's make sure that. Do you all see the? There are four windows over here. The left upper window is the main window for scripts, and the lower left lower window is a window for output from running those scripts. And then the right upper window gives you the global environments, like the, the data set of the information. And here you typically see outputs, graphical outputs. So I want to make sure you can see this window, the left upper window clearly, all of you. Is it okay? Okay. So I run this, this is the software called RStudio. If you want to pick up R, I highly recommend you install this RStudio from their website. And uh, it gives you this output immediately and uh, give you, uh, lets you interact with the script very fast. So basically, I look at this. The first step is to, look, uh, is to load those packages. So I load the packages into the environment. And right now, the package I'm gonna, I just loaded will be here on the right lower column. It's fine. We don't have to keep a look at that. And second, let me just uh, set a path. And second step, we want to read the data and prepare data. I read the data in, the data you just saw called customer churn data, as the raw data. But I also made a copy of this raw data called data so that I can manipulate on the data while keeping a copy of the raw data just in case I might want to refer back to it. I actually didn't end up using it, but sometimes you want to. So now we have two pieces of data, which are pretty much the same thing, data and raw data. And next, I just demo feature construction. Uh, just, I will going to construct three features because we have day minutes and day calls we can calculate in the daytime, what's the average minutes per call? <coughs> and same thing for evening and night. So I construct these three features over here. Now the data set has the three more columns than the raw data set. You can see that from here. So on the data has a 26 variables and raw data has only 23. So that's where you keep track of you know, the overall structure. There's another way to quickly check the data set, which is a, a STR structure of data. And if you do structure of data, you have a quick summary overview in the output window. Tells you uh, what's the overall look like and what each especially important is what's the column type of each column, which you want to check. Okay. So after that, we want to check the correlation. The way I do it is first I create another copy from the data called new data. And this is, I'm going to turn the data turn all columns into numeric columns so that because correlation is only calculated on numeric, there are two things you can do. You can either get rid of all character or factor columns, or you can convert them into factor and then to numeric. So I'm going to do the latter, and then convert all of them. So I create a core underscore data 
which is basically calculating the correlation. I run this comment and show you what this correlate data look like. It has three columns, V1, V2, and correlation. And it, we can run head of core data, take the quick view of the top of the data set. You see three columns are basically the V1 and V2 are columns, column names. And correlation tells you uh, the, a value between negative one and one between those two columns. And naturally, of course, if V1 is the same as V2, you have one correlation. And of course, when you have two columns that are directly proportional to each other, you have a one correlation. So now we want to have an overview of this core data quickly. So one way to do that is to plot it. I use ggplot, which is one of the well-known um, package, ggplot2 in R very great for data visualization, so we visualize the whole thing. You probably don't see very clearly what these columns are. It's okay, it's look it from a far away point of view, because I already highlighted, uh, I, I labeled uh, each cell with the correlation number, and then put the color over there. The deeper, darker color means higher correlation. So you see, naturally, the diagonal is filled with ones, but we notice some non-diagonal position ones like this, this, and this. What are they? So. Because I can see that here, the first one correlation over here not happening on diagonal is day charge and day minutes. Okay, that makes sense. Your day charge was directly proportional to day minutes. The next one is nine charge and nine minutes. So, so apparently we should get rid of the char underscore charge columns because they're completely redundant. We notice one more thing. Here's a 0 0.96. That's a very high correlation. Let's take a look. It is between voicemail messages and is voicemail plan. Okay, so people who never, who are not on voicemail plan have zero messages, and because they couldn't ever. And people who are on voicemail plan will always have some messages. And the column voicemail messages will carry a little bit more information than voicemail plan. So we're gonna get rid of the voicemail plan one and keep the a little bit more informative voicemail message column. So we're gonna do that later. So this is what correlation matrix is for. I'll give you a quick overview of the correlation between all variables. Oh, we're ready to move on to the next steps. I want to do something about the state group. Here's what I, I show you the result. Now whenever I highlighted some scripts over here and then just hit command and return, if you're using Windows PC, you use a different keyboard shortcut, and that will all just run the script and then see the output over here. I was looking at the state column. State column was a factor column with 50, 51 different levels. 51 different levels because I know that I want to run a random forest algorithm later, which only allow you to have for each factor column at most 25 levels. So there are many different ways you can handle that. A very straightforward way I'm taking here is that I take the top 24 high frequent states and then group the rest as other. So then you obtain 25 levels naturally. So that's what I did. So I, I turned the state column into state group. So some of the, most of the states are kept as, you know, KS is KS, but OK, Oklahoma becomes other because it went into the other grouping. So now we obtain a new column called state group, which means I'm gonna get rid of the state column later. Okay. So there's a bunch of things I've already done and gathering those information and thoughts, I'm removing those columns. I remove customer ID because it's just an identity column, it doesn't carry in any information. I remove days renew because we're about to predict churn is underscore churn. Days renew is highly correlated to is churn. If we include this, it would be 100% predictable no matter what. If you think about it. So we want to remove it. And state column, you know why. Area code, because it doesn't carry any information. It's noise data. Phone number, of course, get rid of it. And is voicemail plan of the rest, you know why. So, so I've sorted out the data to such a format. Right now, our data set has 80, 18 variables with some constructed column, some removed column, okay? There are a bunch of things you want to check, check missing data. In R, the complete dot cases uh, for data set 
gives you the missing data. So I have the number of rows in row in here. If this in row is greater than zero, I want to print out an error message. So if I run this and I don't see any printout, it means there's no missing data in there. <coughs> so the step three, now we're ready to go to the machine learning step. Okay. For machine learning to happen, first thing is to split the data set in training and testing. I know you're familiar with that because of course you don't want to, you don't have anything to predict. Uh, you don't split. So I create a function in R and it takes in a seed parameter and the ratio parameter. The ratio is set to be uh, default to be 0 0.5, half half split, but if I want a different ratio, I can specify it when I call this function. So let me show you what I generate a seed and I record the seed if I wanted to use it later. And I split, I split those data. I choose the ratio 2, two, three, uh, two to 1, so because the overall data set is a bit tiny, it has only 3,000 rows, so I chose two thirds of it to be training and uh, one third of it to be testing. And after that, we can take a quick look at the um, result. There are two data sets over here, training and testing, split by two to win. So are good, okay. Now, we can run the random forest. And this is loading a package called random forest in R. And to run it, it's pretty simple. You can specify as many parameters as you like. And if you want to uh, understand which parameters are there, you can type in the window here, question mark random forest. And on the right lower window, you have a classification random forest function and see all the parameters you want to specify or want to take a deeper look at. Okay. Let's introduce you what I put in here. So I want to run the model. I want to predict is underscore churn versus the rest of the columns. And use a data set called training. And take 100 trees, the forest of 100 trees. And take n try equals 5. The 5 is the number of splits you want to have on each of the decision tree level splitting. And usually we take the square root of number of features. We have 18 features out here, actually set 17 features. And you can take the square root and it gives you either 4 or 5. Probably 4 is better, but 5 works. And replacement equals 2 means whether or not for any each of the level of random sampling you want to reuse those uh, replacement or not. If this is a tiny sample, we of course want to use replacement. And the importance equals true means I want to have the variable importance recorded so that I can make use of it later, which you will see. So I run this and generate a model. This is a tiny set, this is very good, so it takes like no time to run. If you had a hundred million, which I had the other day, actually it was stuck for hours, but sometimes it finishes. <laughs> sometimes it doesn't. Um, so I'm gonna, Evaluate this model using ROC, and this is uh, I call this package copy ROC using a simple ROC function. What I will do here is basically get the training actual and training predicted, as well as testing actual testing predicted. I'm going to plot the ROC of training data set on the left side and the testing data set on the right side. You're familiar with ROC, right? So specificity is in sensitivity. So basically, ROC. Uh, you have specificity, which is a true, post, uh, true, neg uh, true positive rate, and th this is true. Yeah, this is true positive rate. This is true negative rate, and so you have um, specificity like that. And then the best curve is basically what you see over here. The model was wrong on the training data set, of course. It achieved like maximum possible. Uh, LOC equals one means you cannot do any better. But on the testing data side, we see that the LOC area on the curve for ROC is 94%. It's pretty good, very good, actually. So it's a pretty ideal uh, data set. We didn't have to do anything more to make it work. Um, in the re reality, if you don't achieve a good result, there are multiple things you can do. You can use cross-validation, for example, to select better parameter, and you can try testing a different parameter. And of course, you can run 500 trees instead of 100. The more trees you grow, the better accuracy you get from random forest. It's only that it will take a way much longer for the model to run also. 
So after we think this is uh, pretty good, so we do quick cleanup and then do the last thing, which is taking the top features. The top features here, let me take the output, the top features If you use R, use a run any machine learning algorithm in R, most of them, and uh, and while loading current package, you can get the top feature set. But Random Forest uh, has a, this nice visualization as a built-in in the package, mm -hmm. Random Forest. So I can take that um, top feature set from the Random Forest. It gives you basically uh, the all right, let me explain mean decrease accuracy. It means by removing that column, the feature, say the first one, how much sacrifice, or how much would it hurt your, for your model's accuracy? Okay, so that's what it means. And um, so, yeah, all right. So usually you look for a visible gap between the feature importance, okay? So the top three ones have a visible gap to the rest. Just now I didn't run that one because Every time you rerun the random bars, you obtain a slightly different model because it's naturally random in selecting all the you know, random uh, data. Um, but if you run it multiple times and see constantly some top features like these three staying on top from the rest, you know that these are important features. There's no randomness in that. Okay. So the top features, three features we identify from this model are customer service calls, is international plan, and day minutes. We can take a quicker look, deeper look at what they really mean, how they really do. So customer service costs, okay? You have from zero up to nine customer service costs for each customer, and you can group them, and the horizontal bar length equals the number of customers in each group. And the mark over here means the churn rate. And also the churn rate, uh, I color them so that the color represents the churn rate as well. So what we see here is basically, for one thing, the more customer, uh, customer phone calls, the more churn, higher churn rate. So interesting thing over here between zero and one to three. So if a customer made zero phone calls, it actually has higher churn rate than customers made one or two or three phone calls. In a way that the customers who made one or two or three phone calls are engaged customers. The engagement is a very big thing in terms of you know, data mining in general. They're more engaged than customers who doesn't even care, who may have trouble but didn't care to make the phone call, just turned silently. Of course, if a customer uh, called way too often, maybe they're really not happy about the result. They wasted way too much time on it. So you can make sense of it. And it's also nice at this point for you to bring uh, your visualization like this to the business users who take care of customers. Get their insights, talk to them. And that's the time where you can come back and do even better job on it. So we can group these customers by three groups, zero, low, and high. And if you really, roughly speaking, because the zero and the low group are very similar, you can group them just into a low group as well. So you can do either way. Make sense? Okay. Next one is daytime minutes. So daytime minutes is a continuous variable. So we want to uh, take a, there are multiple ways you can uh, convert a continuous variable into a vector variable. I just take a brutal force, divide it up by, three, uh, by 10 intervals. Okay, so this is pretty straightforward. The first group is customers whose state in minutes is between zero and 35, and the second group is 35 between 35 and 70, and so on and so forth. Now you notice a pattern, again, because people who made, who called more, who made more longer phone calls, tend to have a higher churn rate. Personally, this puzzles me because I thought, I would think that people who make more phone calls would have been more engaged and you know, find more value in using this plan and may have a better chance of staying, not churn. And this would be another very good question to bring back to the business user. Talk to people who have direct contact with the customer and understand why. So here we record it as a fact. So we again divide them into small and large group where the large group has a much higher churn rate than the small one, right? 
And the third one is international plan. Because international plan, a customer is either own international plan or not, and they actually make international number phone calls. So I took that international phone call data as well. So the top group are on international plan, the lower group are not on international plan, and among each group, we record the number of international phone calls. A customer could be making international phone calls even if they're not on international plan. So it's different from the voicemail plan situation, right? So then, uh, even if I tried that, I didn't see any additional pattern. Basically, people who are not on the international plan have a much lower churn rate than people who are on the international plan. Again, I, I, don't, I don't understand exactly what it is. Um, but uh, there may be reasons. Maybe the international plan is way too expensive, for example. And people maybe who are on the international plan were or was seduced to purchase the international plan to begin with and didn't like the fact that they didn't make full use of it. So there could be a lot of uh, reasons you can discuss with people, right? Now, piecing together, let's try some prescriptive. Piecing together this information, we can put them in an Excel format, okay, worksheet, like this. Is the international plan yes or no? And among each group, uh, the customer phone call group, zero, low, or high zero, low, or high. And among each group, again, we can have a large and small day minutes group. Large and small day minutes group. Altogether, you have two times three times two, which is 12 groups. But many of the groups may be too small. Look at this one. This group has only one customer in it. Apparently, it's just outlier. Now, groups who had less than 100 customers in it, I call them small groups. I'm going to ignore them. Let's pay attention to only medium-sized or large groups, which where we're left with basically a couple, this group, a small group, uh, this is a group that has that many uh, 176 customers and had a pretty high churn rate, 34%. So that's a alarm group. Another alarm group is uh, this group, non-international phone call, small sized customer service call, and large day minute usage. 229 customers with 43% churn rate, and so on. And some of the large groups, please notice, are actually low churn groups like this group, had a 4% churn rate, 4% churn rate. We can ignore them in our analysis. We really want to pick up the problem sets, okay? So now, uh, for your reference, like we, when we look at that, the churn rate, when we decide whether it's too low or high, we have an overall churn rate marked out here, which is 14%. So what can we do, really do with this data? For one thing, we want to say, OK, for those special groups, we can do special actions to prevent them from churning by giving them special promotions even before their expiration has, is, is coming so that they will be more, you know, have a, be motivated to stay with you. And suppose, hypothetically, your action made sense, and you did some promotion, and you were able to say to, stop 10% of the churn customers from churning, what extra revenue would have come out of that? You can do a quick calculation over here. Because we have uh, the day charge, night charge, and evening charge, so no, we know the total revenue each customer generated, and we can calculate the average charge or average revenue generated within each group accordingly, and then look at the simple math arithmetic. So look at the total customers, and look at the churn customer, 176 times 40, 34% times 10%.